So my name is Casey Roberts. I head up the sales organization here at Classy. And um, I have the pleasure of introducing our next panel. Um, it's certainly a very relevant topic in, our, in today's world, and that's building resilient communities. So I'm honored to be able to welcome the following panelists to the stage. Uh, Mega Desai, who's the president of the Desai Foundation. Ataya Martin, who is the chief resilience officer for the city of Boston. We've got Aaron Scheinberg here as the executive director Northeast at the Mission Continues. Lori Barnett, who is the managing director of Southwest Airlines. And Malika Berry, who is the chief programs officer at Points of Light. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Mega. Awesome. Hi, guys. How's your morning panel so far? Um, all right, so uh, what I wanted to do is take a moment and allow everyone to tell them, um, introduce themselves properly and uh, see so everyone can get to know them. Um, and then we're going to have a, a, a little discussion about building resilient communities, what that means, uh, what are some of the watchouts, and um, how different groups can work together in order to accomplish the goals that we're trying to achieve. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Awesome. All right. And we all know it's hot, so if you need to fan yourself or get up and move around, we totally understand. Um, I'm going to start actually at the end here. If you could just, everyone just give me your name and uh, a little bit about you, what you do and, and what you represent. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Malika Berry. Maybe I'm too close. Uh, my name is Malika Berry. I'm Chief Programs Officer with Points of Light. And for those of you who know us, um, we are a, the largest voluntary organization in the world. We inspire and equip mobilize volunteers to do good in their communities. And for 27 years, um, for 27 years, we have watched anecdotally as volunteers really make significant changes in their community. And not only just do one amazing thing, but do thousands, thousands of volunteers do incredible things to stabilize their communities. And over the last uh, four years in particular, we decided to be really specific about focusing volunteers on specific issues, five in particular, and we'll spend more time talking about that. Um, but really wanted to focus volunteers on particular issues to determine if focused on those issues, could we not only change what outcomes happen for individuals, what would happen for communities, um, and the, the spoiler is, yeah, volunteers can. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Laurie Barnett, and I'm with Southwest Airlines, and I'm just happy to be here and be a sponsor of the Classy Collaborative. I hope you all enjoy and just maximize your time here and get a lot out of it. Um, at Southwest, we have been around for 46 years this week, and um, I've been with Southwest 20 years, and I have the privilege of leading our communications and outreach department, and I've been doing outreach work for about 10 years, and um, you know, our focus is really to be sure that we are um, loving people, building resilience, and living responsibly. So we're going to talk more about that today in our, um, our focus program and um, how we're working to build resilience in the communities that we serve in 101 destinations across the country and, and um, across the world. Amazing. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome. Good morning. I'm Aaron Scheinberg. So for the last five years, I've been running uh, the East Coast operations of the Mission Continues. We're a national veterans nonprofit, and our goal is to put as many veterans as possible into roles of community leadership, community service, so that we can inspire the next generation that's coming after us to look at service to our communities, to our country as a, a duty. So right now we've got um, 70 different operations all over the country, including here in Boston. And um, just like many of the veterans that have signed up to continue to serve through the Mission Continues, uh, I'm a military veteran. I served in Iraq through the Army. And uh, after going to grad school and working in management consulting, I needed something different. I needed to serve again. I needed to be part of something important. I was really missing that, um, even though I had a very lucky transition. Uh, and many veterans, they're missing that too. They're missing the camaraderie and the ability to serve at a very high level. And we create those opportunities. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Dr. Atia Martin. I'm the Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Boston. What does that mean? So that basically means that the City of Boston received a grant from 100 Resilient Cities, which was started by the Rockefeller Foundation. And the idea was that we will develop a resilient strategy 
uh, first for the city of Boston and implemented uh, as part of the uh, leveraging the process that 100 resilient cities has put together. Now, those who are very familiar with Boston know that we do things a little bit differently in Boston. So for us, we decided that resilience, when we really look at the root causes of many of the gaps in resilience that we're facing across all types of areas of resilience, whether it's infrastructure, uh, whether it's the economy, whether it's social, whether it's the environment, whatever type of resilience that we're talking about, what we recognize is that the inequities that we're seeing across our communities within the city of Boston is really the biggest challenge that we have around building resilience. And explicitly when we look at the data that racial inequities are the biggest gaps that we're seeing, whether it's before an emergency and day-to-day -day life challenges, as well as what happens after emergencies. And so there is this very real relationship between what's happening in communities on a day-to-day -day basis versus what happens when there's an emergency. They're actually not, they're actually one in the same. Emergencies just pull the covers off and exponentially worsen existing circumstances and communities in all of those areas of resilience. Uh, my background in coming into this was really coming from the federal uh, government um, as an active duty Air Force member assigned to the National Security Agency. When I came home from the military, I was at the FBI, uh, the Boston office, um, I was at the police department, the mayor's office of emergency management, the office of public health preparedness at the Boston Public Health Commission, and then I ended up in this role. So happy to talk more when we get there um, about kind of the bigger picture relationship and theory of change that we've laid out for our resilient strategy for Boston. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Mega Desai, and um, I run an organization called the Desai Foundation. We're a public nonprofit uh, that focuses on empowering women and children through community programming to elevate health and livelihood, and we operate both in India and in the U.S. Um, our, our biggest program right now is around sanitary napkins, and I know that you're thinking, well, that's not a resilient community program, but it is um, because we're actually putting the women inside the community to work to educate them on the health consequences of why they use sanitary napkins and then also helping them distribute and educate the, the other members of the community. You know, I was going to dig in right away into what resilience means, and you did a really good job of kind of laying out the different pillars of resilience. Um, I'd love to hear an example of an, a successful, resilient project that the city of Boston has had. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about like, what, that, what the factors were that you looked at in, in terms of success. So, the, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. So um, for us, one of the interesting things is that resilience um, didn't come to Boston when I showed up. We've been doing work across many decades that has built the resilience of the city. Um, so for the resilient strategy though, which we are launching in the next few weeks, um, we're looking at over 20 initiatives. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give an example of one that I think is an interesting intersection of, of multiple um, issue areas that kind of reflects a resilient initiative. So uh, we're, most folks kind of tend to go towards the infrastructure environment stuff. So if we sit in that category and look at microgrids, everyone familiar with what a microgrid is? No, okay, perfect. I always have to do, do the check set of assumptions. Um, so a microgrid is basically, I like to call it a generator on steroids. All right, so instead of just giving power to one building, it can give power to an entire area. And a lot of people refer to it as um, distributed energy. Um, and so there's multiple benefits to it. Number one, it helps regulate or reduce the cost of day-to-day -day usage of an electricity system um, because it will help reduce the impact on the grid during really high peak times. Uh, so there's a regular ongoing savings there. When there are problems with the, um, with the main electrical grid that impacts everyone who's on that grid, the system will kick in like a generator and ensure that all of the operations in the area are able to run. Um, the other interesting thing is looking at, but how do we also look at other multiple benefits? So this is about emergency preparedness, but it's also space. So how do we leverage it as space and partnership with community um, for folks to come together to work on different issues? How do we use it as a way to showcase art and culture for, that's representative of the community that it's going to be situated in? Right. Um, and and then the, the, uh, I think the important piece around this is 
the area that we've selected is actually a community of color, which is a rare occurrence for this type of project. Um, it's usually, say, reserved for the seaport areas and innovation districts and things like that. But what we said is instead of using the usual criteria, let's also look at people. Where do we have a lot of vulnerable populations and infrastructure and environment challenges and, and, and. Um, and so that idea of multiple benefits and with the baseline foundation of equity was really at the foundation of how we looked at all of the initiatives that we incorporated in the resilient strategy. So that's one concrete example. That's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Lori, you guys have worked in so many different cities. Um, I'd love to hear, I'd love to ask you the same question about an example of a project that you guys have worked on that you're really excited about in terms of success. Absolutely. So, kind of taking it back to um, our main program, which is called the Heart of the Community Grant Program. And um, our purpose there is to build connections that bring people together to strengthen communities and build resilience. Mm -hmm. And so we have um, had the opportunity over the past four years to give out 20 grants to cities across the United States and one in Mexico City as well. And we seek to do um, very similar to what she was just talking about. We want to bring together people for a collaborative decision making on how to use a public space. Right. So reimagining it so there are elements that help um, combat social isolation essentially and really build robust social networks. And so one of the great um, stories that we have is in, out of Minneapolis and Hennepin um, in the theater, arts, uh, theater district. And this is a really um, vibrant uh, street within their theater district that um, lots of different people from socioeconomical backgrounds hang out there. Or they're coming there for the theater or there might be some people that are um, down on their luck or homeless. And um, as all these different patrons are coming together, and starting to enjoy the space, it was um, really creating a really nice mixture of, um, of a gathering spot. But there were also some folks there that, um, you know, there might be gang problems or there might be drug problems also that were taking place in that general area. So through the collaboration of the different entities that helped to bring about this plaza area or this space that we reimagined, um, this group called Mad Dads decided to take it upon themselves to say, you know what, we want to help take back and make sure that this community is welcoming for everyone. Mm -hmm. And so they decided to, rather than have a policeman on post whenever there's a theater event or a local event coming on, that they would take it upon themselves to volunteer and engage with all the different stakeholders in the community so everybody felt welcome. And even the local police department was able to look at that and say, this is a great model where the local organizations and the local citizens are taking Empower, or feeling empowered to help make a difference. So it's been um, just a great example of success and we love um, going to all the different communities that we're able to provide a grant to and bring in that knowledge together and um, solving local problems. That's awesome, that's also a great tee up to the next question that I have. So, um, you know, a lot of the work represented here on this panel um, focuses around the concept of volunteerism and how important that is, you know, especially with points of light and the mission continues. Um, and even the, the Desai Foundation, we, we rely very heavily on, on, on volunteers. And I wanted to talk a little bit about how you see volunteerism as this engine for change and how it's important for the strength of these communities. Um, and Aaron, I would love to hear your point of view and then as well as Malik Zia. Sure, so we, like I said, we have examples now in 70 different, what we call service platoons, is the program where veterans are at the lead of bringing communities together to solve you know, injustice issues are the most important issues in the community. And I, as veterans, we have a unique perspective because in some ways we come back home as outsiders. You know, we left and then we come back. We also had this really deep, intense experience of community. And we have seen what it looks like when people from all different backgrounds, from all over the country come together and serve and what it means to be a strong community. So when we come back home, um, from my experience for sure, and I know it's the same for many of my generation of veterans, we're really disappointed. Um, whether it's we were changed or we've seen you know, our country or our communities changed, they do not look as strong of communities as we have just experienced. So naturally, we want to take action and do something about that um, through volunteers. And we found that when you do bring people together, sometimes it's the first time communities are coming together to serve, it really starts this uh, you know, positive motion. It's like a catalyst. So if people are serving together, they're talking, 
They're going out and solving a problem. They're building trust. Um, so we have examples you know, all over the country. It's in the South Bronx, uh, we're working with an organization called the Dream Yard Project. And our goal is to, on low-income housing units, to build the world's largest rooftop mural uh, made out of solar paint. So it's an interesting project. But when we started, no one was coming to the table to talk to us um, as veterans. And the more we came out, the more people have joined us. The Bronx Borough President then joined us. Then we started working on other projects, the Bronx River, which is you know, full of trash. So it creates this positive change. Um, and that is what builds trust and communities are doing more. And in some ways, it also highlights some issues that the communities are facing. I don't want to compare it to um, you know, going out and protesting, but it, is, it does have similar types of results that you're, especially when veterans are, are doing this, you're bringing to light certain issues that were never brought to light before or weren't getting the, the right voice. So like here um, in, in Boston, we're working with the uh, Fairmount Greenway Coalition and it's gotten plenty of uh, attention and, and resources, but there's areas and communities that haven't. And now that veterans are working on a, cert a trail in Mattapan, um, we were able to bring that to light to the governor's office, to local officials, um, and bring it you know, top of their priority list because veterans are serving with the community. And I, I think that'll lead to even more conversation. Yeah, that's great. So, uh, at Points of Light, at Points of Light, we um, kind of live on this belief that volunteerism and being civically engaged is the social fabric of community. It actually creates social capital. Social capital is the, the engine that allows people to kind of get to know their neighbor, make, um, create economic stability, may be able to help a young person find their next job. So we really have this, um, someone say, might say an un outsized opinion about the value of volunteerism in community. And so um, you were speaking earlier, Aaron, uh, about protests and I, it made me think that the, the thing that jarred us a bit in, in our belief system at Points of Light was two years ago watching all of the protests happen across the country and recognizing that, um, as we said earlier in the, in the panel discussion, that we've got, nonprofits have got to become and have been innovative, have been thinking about things differently always, and so we stopped to think about this engine of social engagement, this issue of social capital. How, in, how is it going to be effective for communities that are really struggling with um, not only a race and equity divide, but also a divide of resources where it looks like more social problems are stacked upon a community than that community can bear. And so we started to look at what makes community. We actually just went to the beginning. We started from the beginning and we rediscovered, um, repackaged the social determinants of health. Those four things that Mr. Foss talked about at the, at the keynote um, presentations this morning, education, e um, economic opportunity, employment, um, housing and safe housing and health, health um, and access to health care. We looked at those four areas and then the fifth one is civic engagement. And so there are actually five social determinants of health. But when we looked at those five areas, we said to, a couple of things to ourselves. Not only are volunteers already serving in those areas, that if you were to uh, overlay the 160, 100, more than 160 affiliates nationwide and the more than 30 or more affiliates internationally who are doing work as volunteers and community through points of light, they're already doing work in these five areas. So we are actually stabilizing community, then how can we make longer term change? And so we started to kind of investigate what not only does it look for an individual to make long term change in a, um, in a person's life, but also what does that change look like for the long term in the community's life? And so the social determinants of health are not, um, they for us are uh, kind of an entry point for us to be able to not only discuss that, when a volunteer serves, someone's credit gets better, someone has access to a home, an elder has food, um, someone, um, a young person, opportunity youth, has an opportunity to find their new pathway to career or college. Those are discrete benefits that happen because volunteers serve, but in one place, if we were to do all of those things at one time, there is a broader benefit for the entirety of the community. The community itself is stronger. And so we spend a lot of time in the last four years bearing that out and proving that to ourselves so that we can once again prove it to you so that volunteerism isn't just nice, but it's incredibly necessary for building these resilient communities because after Aaron's team is gone, it's Aaron's volunteers and points of lights 
volunteers that are here every day. These are the people who live in the neighborhoods and communities and to be a part of the change, not only as a visionary for what change could be, but every day to put their hands on the levers and make that change happen is incredibly important. That's exactly right. Thank you. Lori, um, at Southwest, um, the program is uh, so much around building communities uh, with heart and social resilience, which I love, uh, I love that idea. Can you talk a little bit about your commitment to public space um, and why that is such an important role in building um, a resilient community? Absolutely. Well, for us, um, you know, we didn't just, we didn't always have this focus. We've been giving back to our community since our inception but we really tried to find, I think, a corporation, it's important to find your sweet spot, right? Where can you make a difference? And I think it's important that that connects to your purpose. And so our purpose is to connect people to what's important in their lives through friendly, reliable, and low-cost air travel. So the word connect, that's really where we centered all of our energy on and essentially said, you know, connections are so important. And all these examples everyone's given, that social connection piece is really where we feel like we can help move the needle so, um, you know, our commitment has been, um, it's been great support from our leadership team because, you know, we care about our customers and where they live and work and play, as well as our employees. So I think anytime you're um, investing in your employees, investing in your local community, you're going to see the dividends pay back. And, um, you know, we've helped um, the, the communities that we've seen and that we've worked with already um, at the first three years have had a four to one return on investment. And that's tangible improvements. So that's you know jobs, that is bringing more visitors to their location and these spaces that we're creating, as well as just, again, having um, improved social connectedness. The other issue that we really saw, I think that we're um, gonna be needing to watch out for is social isolation. And you know, even, I heard it yesterday on the airplane, it was kind of funny, I was flying here and um, we didn't have Wi-Fi. Oh. So when someone you know, came on the loudspeaker and said, you're not going to have Wi-Fi, but how about you try some of that good old-fashioned talking to your neighbor? You know, again, um, we understand that people, um, on average, Americans are spending 4.7 hours a day on their phones. And again, you know, if you're not connecting with your neighbor, if you don't know your neighbor, there's going to be problems when those difficult times come if you don't have that connectedness. So what we really like to do is to be sure that we are um, creating something that's going to be sustainable, sustainable by the local citizens, the local organizations, meaningful to the local government as well, um, that's going to really help um, the community flourish. Awesome. Um, I am going to skip ahead to another question, but um, based on what I'm hearing here, um, everyone in this room kind of understands, based on what everyone here is talking about, the fundamentals of volunteerism, the fundamentals of connectivity for a community, and the different points of resiliency. And I want to talk a little bit about public-private partnerships. Um, I think we all know how important that is in building a resilient community. Um, and Atiyah, I'd love to hear how the city of Boston leverages some of these partnerships uh, in order to build a strong city. Do you have a good example of, uh, uh, of, of an example of a public-private partnership? Absolutely, there we go. Um, so actually I wanna give some framing before I give the example, because I think it, context is important. Um, so when we talk about social isolation and the challenges that our communities are facing, um, what we recognize because of, it's very explicit in the research is that our social networks are incredibly racially segregated. Mm -hmm. When we look across the board, what we're seeing is that um, white networks are, um, and I don't mean social networks, real people in our real lives that we would have over to our house for dinner, uh, not those pretend people online. Um, but this idea that the reality is that white networks are all, almost 90% exclusively white, African-American networks are over 80% exclusively African-American, and when we look at Hispanic, Latino, even though, or Latinx, um, even though that is also part of those racial categories, it's over 60% uh, explicitly Hispanic or Latino. So we have work to do if we're talking about social isolation and addressing the power dynamics of how we look at the world, how we look at ourselves, what it means when we walk through the door of institutions and organizations, what we're bringing with us, because we're not 
uh, someone different from before we walk through the doors of organizations than we walk through the doors of organizations, even though sometimes we like to pretend. Uh, the reality is that we come with bias. We come with bias that is both explicit and implicit, meaning that we're not actually aware of it because we're constantly being bombarded with information that is saying who people are and how they're supposed to be, even when we don't believe it. So even if we don't believe it in our conscious brain, the part where we hear ourselves talking to each other is not God talking to us, it's ourselves talking to ourselves, that that part of our brain um, is not as powerful as the other part. In fact, our unconscious brain is a million times more powerful than that part where we can actually hear ourselves talk. And it's responsible for over 90% of the stuff that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So all of that framing is important because when we look at um, public-private partnerships and the way that we've embedded racial equity, social justice, and building relationships into um, the way we are look framing resilience um, in order for us to have true citywide resilience that we're not, where we're not leaving people behind. And for folks who aren't aware, the city of Boston is predominantly people of color. It's predominantly people of color, which means we have a lot of work to do in order to close these gaps because it, our success as a city depends on us figuring these issues out. Um, so this idea of an example of um, uh, public-private partnerships, we have several. So I'll give one for time's sake. Um, we're working with the Boston Chamber of Commerce explicitly on addressing issues of racism. So um, addressing issues of racism and advancing racial equity, which aren't necessarily the same things, right? One is responsive, one's proactive. Um, and so really looking at how do we support organizations in different sectors to also see this as a responsibility. So our framing is that this is a, pers a personal responsibility in our personal and professional lives. And this is an organizational responsibility because racism and all that comes with it, and modern racism in particular, um, all that comes with it really is in the way of us being as successful as we can be. Um, and so for us, we're really looking at how do we help organizations have tools and a shared understanding of how we move forward as a city in order to be proactive in addressing these issues. It is not a status quo thing. It's not something we just have to live with because it is what it is. There's actually lots of things we can do. So the first thing um, we're, we're in terms of framing of how we're looking at the way you bring organizations on board and, and help them learn from each other and learn from them because there's some private sector organizations and nonprofits who are doing amazing equity work in their organizations. Um, so for this work, um, it's been, uh, the, on the public-private partnership side, has been very amazing. We engaged over 8,000, excuse me, over 11,000 people in the last year and a half as part of this process mm -hmm. since I've come on board both in the private sector, nonprofits, community, particularly grassroots organizations, and actual residents in the city. Um, so for this, this piece around um, the importance of public-private partnerships, it's the public-private partnerships, but it's also personalizing the work as a responsibility. Um, because right now, we're in a situation where uh, we need some humility in order to create some space for ourselves to be able to do the work. Um, and so it means that we have to recognize that our humanity is what it is and that we are, um, our brains work a certain way and we have a certain history in this country and a certain social context that impacts how we engage with ourselves and how we see ourselves in this world, how we engage with other people and what happens in institutions when you bring all those people together and how we look at policies and practices. I love that. And we'll get back to that humanity and dignity in a second. But I'd love to hear another example. I know that Points of Light and Southwest have a beautiful um, public-private partnership, and I'd love the opportunity for you guys to share with the audience maybe one or two key factors that has led to the success of that partnership. Um, and obviously, tell them a little bit about the partnership. <laughs> So together, we are working on um, building Points of Life's re resilient community strategy. And our focus is, of course, in space and place and placemaking. Um, and that really came from uh, the nexus between our two organizations, understanding that for as long as Points of Light has existed, volunteers have used their physical space as a way to, as a petri dish, to kind of have this experience where you bring lots of people together across race and culture and class, and they get a chance to volunteer and serve together. And we watch the amazing things happen. I wish that we could say that we had a lot of scholarship around it. We don't. We, we just 
watch the sparks fly, and most times they turn out fairly well. Um, and so we have quite a bit of experience around understanding that volunteers' role in transforming physical space has been exactly one of the things that we most see um, evident in, in the work that we're doing. However, taking that moment to step back that I described earlier, understanding what the transformation of a physical space can mean to a low-income community. And in those four years where I, that I explained earlier, we took the time to take the step back. We actually took the time to work not with um, interlopers into community, but work with low-income community um, and grassroots organizations, our partners, our affiliates in 250 communities across America and, and globally, to really understand how we show up as points of light and how our affiliates show up and how our volunteers show up as um, community members. And so we've been doing this good work around volunteerism and placemaking, and um, my friends at Southwest heard us sharing some of the things that we've been learning over the last couple of years and, and suggested that together we build this partnership to not only uh, completely flesh out this idea around what placemaking and volunteerism looks like, but also to use some of the, the skill and resources that they bring to the table around placemaking. What we also see is, um, you know, just I think the benefit in the way that we um, really help one another is that we have shared goals. So it's important when you go into a public-private partnership that you um, that that's clear and you're working towards something. But then you also have to be flexible. And I think in particular in this case, um, you know, it's it's obviously trying to um, do our part to solve a really big issue that we all we've all been discussing. But it's important to um, be flexible. We're doing a pilot program. We're picking three cities, and we're going to go ahead and. Um, you know, work with each local market and see how we can understand their particular problems and what resources we can bring to bear. And so, not just creating a space, but also creating, um, bringing volunteers together to create a conversation and really try to move the needle. So, um, yeah, flexibility and shared goals will really help you, um, I think, in the long term as you build your partnerships. Can I offer one other thing? I think the other um, incredibly valuable um, resource that you all brought to the table was actually listening to us um, in terms of who are the experts on the ground. And so when we chose the three communities, we've chosen Atlanta, Chicago, and Phoenix. Um, and when we chose the three communities on the ground, we not only stopped at our own affiliates, but we, stopped, we started the conversation with the nonprofit grassroots partners that are there day in and day out. So for example, in Atlanta, I happen to live in Atlanta, so this one is uh, ever present for me. But in Atlanta, we were working with um, a neighborhood called English Avenue, Vine City. Um, if you all visit us in sports, time, sports season, you will have visited to that neighborhood, it's where our stadiums are. Um, and, um, but that neighborhood has been consistently beset with open air drug dealing and everything that would result from that. And it has happened for more than 20 years. And so um, I think one of the things that Southwest has brought to the table is actually coming to a community um, where lots of corporate brands don't offer their support for that neighborhood and community and showing up in a way that the neighborhood knows that Southwest is there. The neighborhood just, where they're not hiding behind points of light, they are showing up powerfully and that is a public-private partnership which I haven't personally participated in before and I'm exceedingly pleased and proud to be a part of because I think that's what matters. The neighborhood knows who are their partners and they know they are going to have conversations with points of light, with our affiliate in Atlanta, with the volunteers they know and don't know, but also that there'll be thought leadership and support from Southwest moving for forward. And so that's, that's incredibly huge. It's, it's right down to the delivery and the implementation, and that's exciting. That's amazing. And what a beautiful... Um, that, that's amazing. And, and, and what a beautiful illustration about expertise and understanding. Uh, you know, we, we run into that at the Desai Foundation all the time, is people are often curious why we choose the villages that we choose of the 53 villages that we serve. And they don't geographically make 100% logical sense, um, but it, we choose them because we know that there are people on the ground that are going to support us. Because if you don't have the buy-in of the community, there's, there's no way that you can, you can make a significant change. So I now have a question for everyone. Um, you know, everyone here in the audience is building some sort of an organization that's affecting their community or a different community in which they live. And they want their impact to be sustainable. And so the question I wanted to ask, uh, which is a little bit tricky, but um, I wanted to ask, what is the kind of canary in the coal mine that you can look to to say, maybe we're going down the wrong path? 
What are some of those symbols that you can look for in a community that may signal uh, maybe we're not listening, maybe we're not, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm going down the right path, working with the right team, whatever the, the case may be. Um, I, I think that that would be really tangible, useful information for the audience to walk away with in terms of, I want to build a resilient community, what's something I should watch out for? You all can, you all, there we go. You all can kind of guess uh, some of the things that I'm going to say. So number one is, um, there's, there's a quote that I got exposed to last summer that was really powerful for me because I didn't always walk with a cane. And so I got exposed to it um, after I started having my medical issues and it really helped I think reframe a lot of things for me. And that quote is, if it's not your struggle, it's invisible to you. If it's not your struggle, it's invisible to you. So that means you, we don't have context on other people's struggles and experiences because they're not our own. And we're distracted by our own challenges and issues and struggles and perspectives and that. Those are the experiences that dictate the way that we see the world. And I bring that up because the importance of having diversity at tables. So, and not just tables because we want to hear what you think, but because we want you to be part of the decision-making process. And that's fundamentally where the power dynamics begin to shift is when folks are actually part of decision-making. So whenever you're in space and you're, you're engaging with community, um, the idea that we actually slow down and pause for our conscious brain to check ourselves around our own blind spots to say, Who, do we have the right people in the room even? And it's easy to go through a process and realize it at the end when someone else points it out to you, but we don't have to wait to then, right? So really looking at what are the dynamics of the communities I'm working in, who are the most vulnerable populations because their voices usually aren't part of decision-making processes, and what, what are some of the different ways to bring those voices in and being a little bit creative and saying it's not just about saying, well, we had a community meeting and the people who showed up, those are the folks, you know, who, you know, we, we decided to go with or making more, more morality or values judgments on communities because people aren't coming to community meetings. There's a history there. There's a reason people aren't coming to community meetings. Sometimes it's a privilege issue. We actually have a certain level of privilege to be able to go to a community meeting, whereas many of our residents in any city that you go to are in the middle of real life. They're waking up early, dropping kids off, trying to get to work. You then you got to pick, do all that in reverse, and you might have to catch a couple of buses to a train and some other gymnastics, logistical gymnastics, to make the day work to then get home. And now you have to feed children. And so, what does that look like? Um, in terms of engaging with folks who are in the middle of real life and don't have the privilege to be able to show up in community spaces. That means we have to do door knocking. That means we have to ride buses, we have to ride trains, we have to go to people where they are to make sure that we're getting input and figure out who are those key community partners that have certain levels of expertise that we can tap into because there's a lot of expertise in communities, both context and technical expertise and so making sure that where we have those voices at tables in meaningful ways and not just as token um, representatives that we kind of here's what we decided to do what do you think about it and then go back and decide whatever we're going to decide which is usually how we in government and other institutions tend to do things so really shifting that power dynamic where community is in the driver's seat awesome Aaron. I agree with that completely. Yeah. Being the canary in a coal mine is people not showing up, whether it's to uh, volunteer, to serve, or to for the planning community meetings. Uh, so in in my job, one of the things I worry about the most, and is the underlying cause of some of it not showing up, is over promising and under delivering, or you know becoming disillusioned with someone coming in from the outside, or quote unquote coming in and promising that we're going to create this change and mobilizing people and it either leads to nothing or you know they end up leaving and they move on to the next issue whether it's budgetary reasons or their organizations moving you know in a different direction that creates disillusionment so that's when i you know i'm going to these planning meetings and veterans platoon leaders that we have are doing that that's one of the things that we have to make sure we're not doing we have to be real with what we can accomplish together um, and we have to have that conversation about what our capabilities are. Um, the other thing is, you know, with people not coming out to serve, we are trying to create a culture of service. 
And that requires examples of service. It's not just that service happens on its own, that volunteerism happens on its own. It's a culture that has to be um, cultivated. And you know, that is what we're trying to create with as many examples of people going out to service so that the next generation sees service as a duty. So if people aren't showing up, then that not only affects the community right now, but it affects future generations in that community too. I don't know if there's much to add, fabulous answers, um, but in particular, I think about you know, just continuing to move forward. So I think one of those canaries in the coal mine would be if you see stagnation. So uh, it's really important to have transformational capacity building. And by that, I mean passing on knowledge, right? Passing on and equipping the next generation. And um, so I think if we become stagnant, if we aren't um, having those multidisciplinary conversations at the table, um, then we're not going to be able to move forward. And um, we know how long it takes to create change and to really see the benefit from that. Um, so it's really important to kind of keep your tabs on the health of the community, you know, measurements or find some measurements that really make a difference or um, really report on the impact of the work that you're doing and check those, report on them, hold yourself accountable um, and be sure that you're creating capacity to continue to transform your community. Malika. I would add that, um, it, it, just Atiya, hearing you, some of the things that happened in our sector about in the 90s, we had a, we, the terminology we would use for what you're talking about is parachute volunteerism, but we would drop in and do something spectacular and leave and then <laughs> wonder why people didn't come play in the new garden. Well, um, it wasn't the communities. Um, one of the things that I think is a canary in the coal mine is when you leave something spectacular for someone and they don't want it because it's not what they need. It's not what they want. Um, years ago when I was an early, uh, com I would not call myself a community organizer, but working with, in communities, um, one of the things that we were in the midst of making this very mistake that you, Aaron, has talked about as well, um, and the neighborhood um, women told us, we actually don't need whatever it is you're planning over there. We need an after-school program. We need a summer camp for, the young girls who are coming at spring break, was actually a spring break camp. They needed a spring break camp because that was a neighborhood that was bordered by lots of adult clubs. And people were preying on the little girls as they were walking home from school, trying to indoctrinate them into what was happening in the clubs. So those mothers told us, come with me and let's organize a summer camp. That's what we ended up doing with our time and our resources until they kicked us out because they knew how to do it just fine themselves and they didn't need us any longer. And so I think the canary in the coal mine for me is to not only make sure that we have the right people at the table who are listening, but that we are responsive in creating the thing that the neighborhood and the community really wants rather than the thing that we think is what the community really needs. That's wonderful. Um, I have one more question for the panel, and then we'll open up for some questions if you guys have any. Um, and it really is actually stemming beautifully off of what um, Malika and Lori were talking about. At the Decide Foundation, the metric that we use to calculate whether we are successful in our programming is around dignity. Um, and so, you know, my dream one day is to create some sort of dignity index, but I don't have the, the resources or the know-how to do that yet. Um, but um, the the kind of idea of when you don't know what the community really needs. So we had a sewing program uh, in one village, and then about 20 miles later, we had the same apart, uh, same sewing program. These women take the class for three months, they learned how to sew, and then they are offered a, a job in a factory for which we've, we've pre-negotiated the salaries. In one village, 80% of the women took those jobs, resulting in a $1,000 investment from our organization, resulting in a $16,000 capital raise from their, for, their, for their community. Which was, we were like, yes, yes, we are winning, this is working. And then on the other community, for some reason, 0% of the women took those jobs. And we thought to ourselves, what, what's happening here? And I think because I go there all the time and I'm there, I was able to see that both of these projects were equally as successful. It was just a matter about the metric that we were choosing to measure it by, right? So if financial, if, if it was a financial metric, one works. It, but if it was really just about dignity, you can look at both communities as success. 
Most of the women just wanted to get out of the house, learn a skill, hang out with their friends. And so my question to the panel is, what has been the most useful metric for you? And I know this is a very tough question because uh, there are multiple uh, metrics that are used, but for you, what is the thing personally that has been like, this is the one that I always trust, or this is what my gut always aligns with? Uh, I think it'd be really helpful for the audience here to hear about what that metric might be, and answer at will. This, this is the one that came right to my mind. Um, it's the number of um, uh, individuals who benefited from the effort who come back and participate as a volunteer. So um, we have a financial coaching program. Financial coaching um, allows individuals, has typically not been available to low-income communities. It's a, a service that costs, uh, that costs, and a professional usually delivers it. Um, and we have successfully trained volunteers to be uh, financial coaches, and they deliver the same result. Um, and some they best, sometimes they best the professional market. And so when I see those folks who now have $1,500 in their savings account and they came to us between, you know, $1 and somewhere underneath $1,500 in their savings account, turning around to become financial coaches themselves, I know we've done well. If I see an, a young person who we've, who's lost their pathway to college and career, now turning around to become a Vista AmeriCorps volunteer to help another person in their community find their pathway to college and career. I know we've done our job well. Um, and, and, and I think I'm, you know, without speaking for Aaron, if I see a veteran who came home from service and decided that the way in which they want to reacclimate themselves to coming home is to serve, I know we've done our job well. When the people who we do the work for come back and take the work from us, we've done our work. That's beautiful. Yeah. Any yeah, other ideas? Um, I mean, full transparency, we're constantly wrestling with what metric or metrics we're you know, going yeah. after. Why pose the question? <laughs> yeah, anyone who says they have one in the social sector probably doesn't. Um, we're probably changing. Um, but for us, you know, We've talked a lot about community transformation and what the community metrics look like. We think that it's that community transformation and individual transformation together both lead towards the, the long-term impact we're trying to create. So back to your point, um, it always falls back to sense of purpose to us. So are we creating the sense of purpose in the veterans that are participating, which would lead to you know, coming out more and more? And the same thing with our communities. If you're able to create individual sense of purpose, um, which is related to like civic efficacy, the ability to go out and do something, the ability to take action in your community, uh, we think if we're doing that at all of our events, then we're doing the right thing. And if we're not, then we've, we're doing something wrong. Yeah. Awesome. Can I go? Sure. Did you want to go? Okay. <laughs> well, from the corporation standpoint, um, you know, we like to. Um, focus on our employees' volunteerism. So we want to empower our employees who, we have 54,000 employees across the country, and we really want to help them connect to their passion points and help in their communities. So we've always measured our number of volunteer hours. We have a database, we ask people to you know, log their numbers in that. But what we found is there's a lot of people that are passionate or on fire and realize the benefit that they get and the community gets out of serving but that they're quite often the same employees coming out to volunteer. So we changed our goal this year, and it's actually become one of our company goals. It's not just our own little department goal. It's going to be measured and um, really looked at as an entire company is the number of unique employees that are going out and volunteering. Wow. So we're really wanting to just, again, expand exponentially, I guess, the, the amount of people that we've got out there doing good work. So just kind of a different twist on how you could look at that as a company. So we have a bunch of fancy metrics that we use, that we've developed for the resilient strategy and they're all great and aligned with all the best um, practices and all that good stuff. But my metric for if we're doing a good job is whether or not our residents and organizations are happy with what we're doing, right? And so reframing it to not just be about the stuff that funders and everybody else wants us to count and track, but really, are the people who it's meant to be helping happy with what we're doing? Because if that's not the case, then we're not doing it right. Um, and we need to go back and figure out what we need to fix. So, um, so that's my metric. 
Well, I would like to open up for some questions. If there's anyone here that has a microphone at the front here, just uh, stand up or raise your hand. And... Hi, I'm, Hi, I'm uh, Julia Heitner. I'm from um, Iron USA, Learn with the World. We, um, I'm wondering if there's somewhere else I can stand, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and we connect um, uh, educators and uh, students in 140 countries together through global citizenship projects. Um, and I love that you just talked about metrics because I find that as we're applying for grants, um, especially the kind of more tech savvy, the grantee, the grantors, the funders get, um, the more specific the questions are about, you know, how many, you know, percent, percent of, how are you serving people in this percent and that percent? Um, but our metric, I would say, is empathy, creating empathy between culture. Um, I'm just sort of wondering how you go about, you know, filling the funder's needs um, with these kind of special metrics that you're talking about. So, um, we're... Hello? Okay. So we're a voluntary organization. So typically our peers in the sector, other larger intermediaries like ourselves, aren't tracking the metrics that we're tracking. Um, um, largely because our DNA in the sector is really around volunteer projects, hours, number of volunteers, um, and, uh, you know, um, l land reclaimed or, you know, meals packaged, like the thing that we are delivering to benefit an individual or a community, that those are typically our metrics. We actually took the time to actually build a different um, uh, database that we tested on a couple of different platforms. We, we built something off the shelf um, and that we could customize. We built something from the Salesforce platform and we also built something on the Google platform with all with different of our pro different programs. The connector between all of those programs were um, we use a coaching model in terms of volunteerism so that we can reliably reproduce the same, produce the same result from volunteer to volunteer to, to outcome to outcome. Right. And so um, that is the connective tissue between any of those options. Um, not because Salesforce is a wonderful partner, Flassy, but in truth, um, the Salesforce platform was exactly the best option for us because I can tell you today if Malika Berry served and Jane Doe's credit got better, I can tell you as a company that how many of your employees were involved in that, and I can also tell you um, in a location how many individuals were better because we have the ability to sort our data in that way. I also think we really have to be clear about what we can reach, and our evaluation team and myself spent quite a bit of time actually recognizing that if it's a young person's goal to get a job, we're not gonna be around to see that young person get a job, right? If it's, a, if it's an individual's desire to buy their first home or their first car, you're probably not gonna be there to see that. But what we will see are the indicators toward that success. So we'll see a bank account, we'll see paying bills on time, we'll see a young person filling out applications for school, we'll see them set a pathway toward their goal. And so we started to track the volunteer's ability to move an individual toward that pathway of success as indicators toward success rather than considering the end result being the only thing that we care about. We can't promise that everyone we work with will get a job, but we can promise we will give you the skills that make it possible for you to get a job. Hi, I'm Pat. I work with uh, Zevin Asset Management. We do uh, shareholder advocacy out of Boston for our clients and so push companies on the environment and human rights and resilient communities. Uh, so I think a lot about what big corporations like Southwest, I'm so glad that you're here, can do to help build resilient communities beyond the foundation, beyond simply, you know, maybe just doing less harm or no harm. So for other folks on the panel, like what do you think the role of big established corporations are or should be beyond the foundation? What do you hope for when you're in a city, when you're even in a neighborhood? Uh, what do you wish you were getting out of the major civic players that are corporations uh, that would help you do your work? Uh, uh, I have an answer. <laughs> uh, there, you want to start? Or, yeah, okay, go ahead. So, hello, Tess, there we go. Uh, so for me, one of the big things is it's almost more of a um, 
a shift in thinking and culture, which is the fact that organizations and institutions, large corporations, are part of a community, right? And so, um, and I think a lot of times it's not seen that way necessarily that folks are actually part of areas of the cities that they're physically in. Um, and so, and, and then the other piece is that we have a lot of organizations who have volunteer programs and they go out and they're doing stuff. It would be great if, again, the community was really driving what was being done, right? So folks come up with great ideas and, and it really um, a lot of times perpetuates inequities because people are coming in with what they think a community needs to the point earlier um, instead of what the community actually needs or wants. And it's not for um, us to be making value and moral judgments on communities and what they decide they want and need because every community has different wants and needs. So I think that fundamentally, those two principles, one around um, making sure that the organizational culture actually sees itself as part of a community and not just um, a, a great upon high, you know, we have resources and we're gonna bestow them upon communities. And then on the other side, um, just making sure that communities are driving um, some of the, um, the work that's happening in communities when organizations are going in or when money is coming into the communities. Um, and then the last piece they'll say is um, the, the benefits of seeing communities um, or seeing or corporations as part of communities that they're actually um, in um, is that we all have diversity challenges in organizations and, and everyone is struggling with it. When you have good relationships across different neighborhoods, you're plugged in in a way where that's also a source of employees, of volunteers, of other folks who um, oftentimes are not seen as um, resources, when there are a lot of resources in communities that can be tapped into um, to create the types of pipelines that we need in order to really um, have the impact on the types of diversity we're looking for. And then the last thing I say, I promise, um, is that it's not enough to just have diversity. The organization actually has to have a commitment to creating a culture where diversity is actually leveraged and invested in and seen as a tangible asset. And what I mean by that is um, when we look at um, the research around why do we um, see such benefits in organizations that have more diversity, it's not just that they have diversity, it's that they're actually leveraging that diversity in ways where people are coming out with better ideas, products, services on the other end. Um, and having real impact um, uh, in terms of dollars. Um, and so really that also that business case for this is pretty significant as well. Um, so that's kind of the, the bigger picture piece and I'll be quiet. I, I c couldn't agree with everything you just said more. I, I, I totally agree with you. There's one other thing I would add. Um, on our end, I, I worked in corporate marketing and communications for 12 years uh, or a little more than that actually. and. Uh, one of the things that really frustrates me right now working with a nonprofit is having this big barrier every time I approach a corporation, them thinking that I always want money. And oftentimes, I don't want their money. I want their research. I want their data. When you are Unilever or Procter & Gamble and you have spent millions of dollars a year on understanding your consumer, do you know how much more effectively I could impact that community if I had even a sliver of that data? And I would love it if corporations understood that every time you see a nonprofit pop up in your inbox or in your mailbox, it's not just about money, it's about resources that you already have available to you. And a platform for your work too. Huh? And creating a platform for your work too. Yes, and creating a platform. Southwest put Michigan continues in uh, the In Flight magazine, you know, that's an example as well. Exactly. Thank you. I was gonna I agree with both Atiyah and Desai, and, and um, Mega. I, I just really, um, one of the things that we really figured out is that uh, corporate skills based, the, the corporate volunteer brings quite a bit of skill, and oftentimes small nonprofits, our uh, average affiliate size is one to two staff members, right? Um, and that may include an, a VISTA or AmeriCorps volunteer, so we're talking about um, someone who is given their uh, term for a year of service in their community. We're not talking about another staff person. Right. Um, and so the ability to have someone who can 
offer a particular set of skills and move a project forward may feel like you're, you know, I you mean, know, I do marketing all day. Why would I go to this place and do marketing? The um, impact of that support in a community with an organization that is so small and doing so much is monumental. Yeah. And so we would, you know, money is important and we want it. Yeah. yeah um, but we also absolutely need um, resources and support to do the work smarter and better and do more of it well. Yeah. Is there another question? Craig? Hi. Uh, my, wow, that's really loud. <laughs> my name is Craig Welton. I'm from Best Buddies, and we're a social inclusion, integrated employment, and leadership development program for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And first off, thank you so much for, uh, for your time here today and for all your wonderful service in the community. Um, I know we talked about metrics a little bit. I was hoping that some of you might be able to share your success in promoting your story and actually telling your story. Much of what we do lives in the narrative, not so much in the numbers. Um, and I was hoping maybe you could share some of your successes in that area. Um. So one of the um, initiatives actually for the Resilient strategy, strategy is actually storytelling. Go figure. Um, and it's a, at multiple levels. It's about the story of the process and the work um, and how we got from point A to point M, because we're still going, um, but also the stories of individuals who have been engaged in the process. I think leveraging folks who um, are passionate and have, can tell the story for the organization is really important. Um, and, and helps other people kind of relate a little bit better. Um, I think for us, having individuals tell their story is also really powerful um, because a lot of people, the research, I keep going back to research because I'm a big nerd, I'm sorry guys. Um, but the research is very clear that when we um, are engaging with people, stories work way better than numbers. It just does in terms of how our brain works. Stories, people relate to them better. Um, and so for us, we've had a great kind of grassroots, we're pretty um, guerrilla tactics in the, a lot of the work that we've done out of the um, Resilience and Racial Equity Office. Um, and being able to tell that story through video, online, and having our participants across government and um, communities and, not, and nonprofits, private sector, tell the story themselves has really been the most powerful thing for us. Um, and we actually use it at, a, at events as well. Um, and so we, we oftentimes will invite folks to kind of talk about what this means to them, um, as opposed to us saying, and we think this is awesome, look at all these charts, look at all these numbers. Having other folks do it has just been really powerful for us. Yeah, we were, we were very lucky in the, in the founding of the Continues. Our founder wrote a bestseller about the Continues. That definitely helped. And then Joe Klein, the great author, wrote the book Charlie Mike about our organization and Team Rubicon. That definitely helped. But now we, we've got to really work for it because all those stories are already out there. And very similarly, we want the communities telling our story for us. And our, our brand firm, you go through you know, like training and what, what media picks up as stories. And media picks up stories that are a continuation of, some, of a trend. Uh, they pick up stories that it's like something counter to what you already believe. And media picks up stories that is something brand new and exciting or a change in something that's been going on for a long time. So we have to think that way when we are creating our operations and our service projects. We want to create change. We want to do something new and, and impactful. And we want to flip on its head what people think about either that community or what people think about veterans. And I think when we're able to do that, even at the very local level, that's the stories that get out there. And we're very purposeful. And every time we do something, we think about how, how can this story be told, too, because it's essential to the work. Uh, slightly the opposite on that is, I 100% agree with you. Uh, we work in communities where the women that we serve um, are not going to tell their stories. Uh, they're very shy. They are not used to being in front of a camera. They're not going to carry our torch for us. Uh, simply because that's just not what happens in rural communities in India. And so uh, we often look to their children to help tell our stories. 
um, because it's the children who we see, like if we impact a mother's life, suddenly she has more dignity and therefore she treats her daughter with more dignity. And so suddenly we see the, you know, the rate of school, uh, of, of girls in school go up. And that actually has this very interesting effect. And then we can go to the daughter in school and talk to her about, you know, how has life at home changed and things like that. Um, so unfortunately, it's not as easy for us to um, hear those stories kind of pop out of the community. Um, but so we have to kind of force it and find it in different ways. Oh, that's it? Oh, we're all done? Okay. Well, uh, thank, you, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. Um, I guess we'll stick around for a little bit if anyone has any questions that they want to come up and, and, uh, and chat. But have a wonderful day, and thanks for joining us. Thank you,